Keith, it's really great to have you at Elam Bible Week Ireland, our, our wondrous conference, and it's great to have you doing our Bible studies. Many people who will watch this uh, little video clip will not necessarily know you, so maybe you would fill us in and a little bit of who you are, what you do, and a little bit of your journey, maybe. Sure. Well, you know my name's Keith. Uh, you can tell from my accent that I'm not from this country, I'm from Wales, from South Wales. Um, and come from a little place from, called Caerphilly, which is near to the capital, Cardiff, in the country. Married to Judy. Judy's also Welsh. Um, we have two children. And our son, Luke, is in Papua New Guinea, working as a linguist with Wycliffe Bible Translators with his wife, Laura, and our daughter, Anna Marie, and her husband, Chris, own an art gallery in the Lake District. Uh, been brought up as an Elim person, from a toddler, became a Christian in my teens, um, felt God calling me to be involved in mission activity, and so I did a year with Operation Mobilization in Europe, in Italy, and then went to Bible College, and uh, then planted a church in the north of England for Elim, and for the last 30 years I've been at the Regents Theological College, mainly as a New Testament lecturer, but I'm currently the vice principal there. Was that leads me maybe into asking another question on the subject of theology. Is there a, a theological priority for this generation? Is there something that they should be looking specifically at, holding on to, letting go? Or what's the theological priority of our day? That's a really good question. And I'm so old that I can look back and see changes in uh, Western Christianity, Western Pentecostal Christianity, and even Christianity in the UK. And sometimes in my travels to um, the majority world or Asia, um, I'm sometimes troubled when I see Christians who are desirous of being like us in the West. My fear is that they may be contaminated by some of our uh, spiritual emphases in that they are not emphases that are as valuable um, as uh, they might think they are. For example, I can remember a time in my youth when the Bible was much more centrally a part of the Christian's life than it is now. So now I am nervous that the church in the West is in danger of being quite biblical illiterate because people are not used to engaging with the Bible themselves. And I see this sometimes even in the church as well. Even though we have come to hear from the word, I don't see it as centrally a part of the service. So one of my concerns actually is the place of the Bible in Christianity today, and I want to elevate that. In terms of a theological perspective, speaking to my Pentecostal brothers and sisters, I might say that the Holy Spirit is worth revisiting partly because I think we have assumed that we understand his motivation in being involved in our lives. And truth be told, I think it's far too narrow a perspective and that his agenda is considerably wider and it would surprise us, shock us, if we but realized it, because fundamentally it is such a gracious, generous agenda on our part to do us good. Mm. The topic that you are teaching on this week in the Bible studies at mm. Wondrous is the remarkable spirit and the believer. Mm -hmm. But maybe just for a, a moment or two, you could share with us maybe some misconceptions that the church and believers have, and maybe even um, some mispractices that we have engaged ourselves in that <laughs> maybe we do need to call time on or, mm -hmm. or something like that. Is mm -hmm. there anything specific? Or? <laughs> uh, these are two good questions here. Um, I can tell you a little bit about my journey, which might help, because I can't speak on behalf of all Christians in the Pentecostal family. But for much of my life as a younger Pentecostal Christian, I thought that the Spirit had two main responsibilities in my life. Number one was to find out when I had done things wrong and to catch me and give me a good slap, metaphorically speaking. I thought that's what he was there. He was the hound from heaven who would chase me down. Now I know that the Spirit does have a role in transforming me and, and helping me realize when I've stepped out of line. He does, but I thought that that was a major function of his. And it was combined with the notion that the Spirit was also 
primarily involved in the life of individual believers to give them gifts so that they could then benefit other Christians in the community. And that was a problem for me for a number of reasons. Number one, it made me think of him as being a bit utilitarian. And number two, I wasn't too sure that he liked me because I couldn't see that I had any gifts. And so I just assumed that when God was looking to give gifts and I turned up in the queue, then it was a case of, well, maybe you better come around next time, Keith, and maybe I'll have a gift. And I wasn't overly troubled because when I looked at the Christians in my church, not many of them seemed to have gifts either. So I lived with that. But those were the two main reasons I thought the Spirit was involved in our lives, to give me gifts and to tell me off when I did wrong. And then, some years later, when I actually did him some studies about what the Apostle Paul said about the Spirit, I was so surprised to see that the function of the Spirit was to make some powerful statements about my status as a Christian. So, very quickly, Book of Ephesians, first three chapters, no mention of a gift, no mention of the Spirit telling me off, all to do with what the Spirit unilaterally does for us as Christians, which leaves me sitting back saying, wow, this is remarkable. I never realized that you were this good spirit. Now, when he gets to chapter four, there is a therefore, there are consequences, but it's as if Paul is saying, I'll get to the consequences later of the spirit being in your life, but let me first of all, exhilarate you with the lavish nature of the spirit's love for you as a Christian. That is one of the quests that I have in my life is to help Christians realize that. And if they have a better perception of who he is and his involvement in their lives, I think that it will release them. I think it will stop them trying to manufacture certain practices, certain emotions, because they'll realize that the Spirit is actually quite desirous of working with them as individuals with their varied personalities. Mm. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, you have many roles. You've mentioned that you're the Vice Principal in Regents Theological College. You're also the Director of Doctoral Studies there. Um, you have numerous engagements around the world speaking. Um, you don't arrive there. You didn't parachute out of an aeroplane into that position. Um, how did you get to where you are today, Keith? Oh, sometimes I do pinch myself. Um, and wonder. Here I am, this, this young boy coming from a little town in Kefili out in the countryside and God has privileged me with a number of opportunities. I, I never forget that this is a huge honour for me and um, I'm very conscious that, um, that I need to treat everything that God gives to me with um, with respect for who he is and gratitude and nervousness that I am doing what he has gifted me to do as well as I can. So there's a number of little maxims that I have in my life. So for example, one of them is I have to earn the ears of my audience. Um, once I finish speaking, Whatever has happened with that truth, I almost think, well, that's up to you, Lord. Now, if, if you can bless people with what I've said, I'll be very pleased. But before I speak, I feel the responsibility is on me to work hard at, at developing my craft, if you like, my gift that God has given to me. So that would be one of the motivations in my life to ensure that I deserve, if, if one can ever deserve, if I can deserve the opportunities that, that God gives to me. Um, perhaps one other is that I, I, I have benefited a lot from study. So for me to teach, it's happening because I have given myself to study the given topics. To be honest, I like doing that. And there are some Christians who would think that must be awful, but I quite like it. In fact, I sometimes say to people, if I get to heaven and there's a Bible college, I'll happily join and I'll be a student. And I think there are some Christians who think, oh dear, there's a Bible college that I, I'd prefer to go somewhere else. So God graciously gives us gifts that work with our personalities and characters. Um, and I'm very grateful that he's done that with me. 
maybe one final question and a more maybe a more practical question as well for myself as a pastor and for many people who will watch this uh, video blog uh, tell us something about the practicality of the Holy Spirit in your life as, um, as, a, as, a, as a leader, as a, a teacher, but as also as a Christian, as someone who walks with Jesus day by day and maybe something of your, your devotional life and the role of the Spirit in your devotional life. I found my walk with the Spirit has increased over the last 10-15 years. Um, now that's not to say that I don't spend time engaging with Jesus and the Father and sometimes um, people may think that I'm putting too much emphasis on the Spirit and I need to be sensitive to the possibility that they're mishearing what I'm saying. Truth be told is that I, I, I enjoy engaging with Jesus and I've written as much on Jesus as I have on the Spirit. However, with reference to your question, it seems to me that the role of the Spirit as the face of the Godhead, if you like, in our lives <clears throat> is to engage with us. That's his desire. But his desire is not to intrude into our lives so much as for us to develop within ourselves a discipline and a capacity to hear him speaking. Paul says, walk with the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit. Point being, the Spirit is not a million miles away injecting data into our minds from time to time, but he is there all the time, constantly speaking. My challenge is to be listening as often as possible. Now that sometimes happens, I'll give you an example, sometimes it happens in class, when we're with the students and we're engaging in, I happen to teach New Testament, so we're engaging in the text, and sometimes somebody will say something or ask a question or offer an observation, or even I will do one of those, and suddenly it's as if God has opened up a window into that classroom and said, here I am. It's as if the Spirit says, here I am. And it just needs a pause to say thank you. And in that moment, if you like, a prayer is born, but it's a prayer that was initiated by, mm -hmm. by the Spirit. Mm -hmm. So those occasions are delightful, and the more often they happen, the happier I feel, because I feel that I am increasing my engaging dialogue with the Spirit, hearing Him speak. It of course happens from time to time in, in conversation with an individual when sa one says something and one is conscious that had the touch of the Spirit on it. I suspect that when we get to heaven there will be occasions when we will have our lives videoed and, and looked at and the Lord may say to us, do you see that there? That was the Spirit's involvement and we will be surprised. So I hope that there will be times of that in the future. But for me, my, my challenge to me is, Keith, are you listening to the Spirit as often as you could? And that's what I want to do. Keith, thank you. Thank you for taking the time out. I know you're already busy this week. Thank you for taking the time out. Keith is taking our Bible studies every morning at Bible Week, at Wondrous Bible Week. And we invite you to come along and hear much, much more of just the snippets of what we have talked about today. But we have already heard this morning, on Monday morning, such a, a, a real insight into the Spirit in our lives. And I welcome you to come along and join with us every morning this week at 11 o'clock.